Hello, friend. You're listening to Emmanuel Cares, a podcast of Emmanuel Lutheran Church of Shirley, Wisconsin. Today we are celebrating the fourth Sunday of Advent. The text is 2 Samuel chapter 7, 11 to 16. The sermon theme is the house that God builds is built according to his promise and built on David's greatest son. Let's join the worshipers on December 17, 2023. God's word for today from 2 Samuel chapter 7. We're going to read the second half of verse 11 and all the way to verse 16. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord himself will make a house for you. When your days are complete and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up after you your seed who will come from your own body. I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. When he sins, I will discipline him with a rod used by men and with blows of the sons of men. My faithful mercy will not depart from him as I removed it from Saul, whom I removed to make room for you. Your house will stand firm and your kingdom will endure forever before you. Your throne will be established forever. This is God's word, we pray. Direct us now, gracious Lord, to hear aright your holy word. Assist your minister to preach and let the Holy Spirit teach and let eternal life be found by all who hear the gospel sound. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, see if you can finish the sentence. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. Bible passage that kids say every Christmas service from Luke chapter 2 or some variation of that, some translation of that. But what's the big deal about David? Why are we remembering that every Christmas? Why does Luke have us remember that, that Jesus is from the house and line of David? Why did we hear in the gospel lesson for today That the angel Gabriel said to Mary that he would sit on the throne of his father, David. What's the big deal about David? The big deal about David is from our text from 2 Samuel chapter 7. As in this text, it illustrates for us how important David was in fulfilling the prophecies of the Messiah. How important David was when it comes to your salvation. So as, you, as we go through this text together, that really is our, uh, David helps us understand how God builds his house. He builds his house based on his promises, and he builds his house on David's greatest son. You see, right before our text, actually a day before our text, King David had this grand idea. He was sitting there in a palace that he had built. You, know, you can imagine, if he's got a king, He's won lots of wars. He's got a lot of loot. He's got a lot of gold. He's got wood. He's got resources at his disposal. He builds a beautiful palace for himself. And as he's spending time in this palace, he recognizes that the temple wasn't a temple. It was a tabernacle. The the worship of the Lord was in a tent, a 400-year-old tent. It was a glorious tent. It was beautiful. It was artistic. It had history. But it still was a tent. So David goes to Nathan, who is a prophet, and he says, I would really like to build a temple for the Lord. David is, in in a sense, he is approaching the Lord because he's going through the Lord's servant, the prophet Nathan, to get an answer. And Nathan skips a step. Nathan is supposed to inquire of the Lord whether this is a good thing or not. And instead, Nathan says, go ahead, David. Go ahead, build this temple. It made sense. David has all of this wealth. David is a man after God's own heart. Why would he not build this temple? Well, that night, Nathan had a dream, and the Lord appeared to him and said to to Nathan, no, you go tell David he's not going to build the temple. But instead, tell him this. And that's what our our first lesson was, verses 8 to verse 16. And what we're focusing is on verses 11 to 16. 
And in short, God was not going to have David build a house for him, but rather God was going to build a house for David. God promised David that he was going to expand his house. Not, it was not about David obediently making a house for God. The prophecy that Nathan gave David is what we would call an intermediate prophecy. Some prophecies in the Old Testament have a direct connection to Christ, where that the only fulfillment of that prophecy is found in Jesus. This is what we would call an intermediate prophecy. It has pit stops along the way. Just like if you're going to Michigan, you say you're actually technically going to Chicago, but it's a pit stop along the way. You're, you're trying to get to Michigan. In the same way, this prophecy that God gave David, this promise, would be that his son, Solomon, would build that temple, but it was a pit stop on the way to this greater son that was coming. For David, God will build David's house on a promise, a promise that someone from David's line, that Solomon, would build God's house of worship and a promise that someone from David's line would have an everlasting kingdom. But it's just that. It's a promise. God builds his house on promises, not on our obedience. You would think David he probably had the best of intentions. He was going to build a house for God. But God reminded David, and he reminds us, that God doesn't build his house based on our obedience, on what we do for him, but rather he builds his house on his promises. So practically speaking, for us as Christians, we can fall into that so often. We think of the, the church home that we have. Well, I, we contributed toward this church. We, we built this church. We, we're, we're members of this, this congregation. We, we worship here on Sunday. And we think that somehow that's, going, that's some sort of obedience to God that God should reward. The last couple of weeks when I've had those terrible muscle attacks, it felt like a heart attack. It felt like this was the end for me. And then as I was thinking about that, I was like, well, what should I be doing? Should I be praying to God? Yeah, that's a good choice when you're facing your own death. Should I be confessing the creed? That's what I did. As I confessed the creed, I was remembering God's promises to me through the creed. And either one of those is okay. But we're, we go off the path when we think that somehow that gets us anything from God. That God somehow strengthens our faith based on our obedience to him. Like we do this, we check these boxes off, and then God's going to bless us. It's what we hear all the time. It's what we hear in our culture. Be good, then God will be good to you. But it is not how God builds his house. God builds his house on promises. He made a promise to you, for most of you at your baptism, that he was, you were his own, that he, said, he put his name on you, and he would be faithful to you, that he would, through the means of grace, through the word of God, and through the sacraments, such as the Lord's Supper, he would keep you in that faith. That's his promise. It, it all starts with his promise, not your obedience. Like David, we can get caught up in our obedience to God. But what a neat reminder that we have today, that God deals with us. He builds this house. He builds your faith, your faithful life based on his promises, on his word. He builds this house, not on our obedience, but on his promises. Let's take a closer look at this prophecy, this intermediate prophecy. It doesn't just tell, tell us that God operates by building his house based on promises, but he also builds his house on David's greatest son. We look at verses 13 to 15 through 16. He will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he sins, I will discipline him with a rod used by men and with blows of the sons of men. My faithful mercy will not depart from him as I removed it from Saul, whom I removed to make room for you. Your house will stand firm, and your kingdom will endure forever before you. Your throne will be established forever. 
Although Jesus was the only begotten Son of the Father from all eternity, this relationship between God the Father and the God the Son would enter this awesome phase when Jesus becomes born in time of the Virgin Mary. God, who is the father of the human race because he created Adam and Eve, will also have this aspect with Jesus. The father with Jesus is going to be a father and son relationship. Although Jesus never sinned, Jesus became sin for us with his sufferings and death. So when he prophesied that I will discipline him with my rod used by men and with the blows of the sons of men, we remember what happened on Maundy Thursday and Good Friday when he who had no sin, who was perfect, was treated as if he was the greatest sinner of the world. The Jewish leaders struck him on the side of the face. They spit on him. The Roman guards put a crown of thorns over his head, beat him with a staff, whipped him with a whip. God used the sons of men to punish his son because his son became the sin of the world. Verse 15 is a tough one, isn't it? If we're, we're looking at this and we're, we're thinking of Jesus suffering and dying, how he is undergoing the rod of his father through the hands of men. Verse 15, my faithful mercy will not depart from him as I removed it from Saul, when, when I, whom I mo- removed to make room for you. Because we remember what Jesus said on the cross when he talked about his father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But in this passage it says, my faithful mercy will not depart from him. So how do we reconcile those two? And this is where knowing Hebrew helps. Because that word that we translate faithful mercy is a word that really can't be translated well in the English language. It's hesed which has this idea of loving kindness, faithfulness, mercy, love, all of those concepts in one word. It is a God who keeps his covenant, his promise. That's what's all encapsulated. And what does God promise? He promises mercy. He promises love. He promises faithfulness. These are all things he promises. So it's it's a God who is faithful to his promise. A God who is faithful to his promise is going to make sure that Jesus suffers for the sins of the entire world. So when Jesus in the, is on the cross, and God, according to plan, is, is giving him the torments of hell for every single sin, God is not going to hold back on his promise and say, you know what, I'm going to save some of these for later. I'm going to save some of these for someone else. No, God was faithful to his promise. He was going to make sure that Jesus suffered and died. It wasn't as if God was carrying a grudge and saying, you know, some of those sins really, really bother me, and I don't want Jesus to pay for them. I'm going to have these other people pay for them. No, every one of our sins, God made sure the punishment for that sin was put on Jesus. He was faithful to that promise. From Jesus' perspective, it appeared as if the father had abandoned him. But from our perspective, as we see both the relationship of the son and the father, we see how God the father is faithful to his promise to make sure to punish his son so that you and I would be sons. He punished Jesus on the cross so that he could look at us and see righteous people, people whose sins have been paid for by the blood of his son so that he could remain and keep being the God of faithful love, that Hesed God, loving kindness to you and to me and showing mercy to you and to me because he kept his promise. He kept his covenant there on the cross. We see that all of God's work of punishing Jesus was fulfilled when Jesus says it is finished. And then after that, what does he say? Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. That relationship of Jesus understanding his Father doing everything according to plan. And how his Heavenly Father was still that Hesed God who had Jesus in his hands. Then Jesus rose from the dead. 
And Jesus is going to reign in his kingdom forever. He will, will never stop. Last night at our youth group, we had some Bible passages talking about the incarnation of Jesus, how Jesus became a human being. The exercise we had for the kids was look at these Bible passages. Even if these Bible passages don't talk about what happened on that first Christmas, they just talk about the incarnation of Jesus, Jesus taking on human flesh. And the exercise was they, they had to underline the what, circle the why, and box in how this matters. How, how, how the, so what, basically? How does this matter to each one of the kids? And they had to share it with each other. And it's still an exercise that we can do with this text as well. So what? What does it matter to me that God builds his house on David's greatest son? Consider the manner in which people give you Christmas presents. There are some of us who go shopping for Christmas last minute. Could be even Christmas Eve. We're looking at Amazon and we're saying, Amazon, I got this, this window to order from Amazon before it gets here before Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. Consider someone who shops last minute to someone who has spent a ton of time looking for your Christmas present. Maybe they went to actual stores and, and were trying to find the perfect gift for you. This is how we should consider God giving the gift of his son to us. It wasn't some last minute thing. This is something God had planned from eternity, from the time that he promised Adam and Eve that the seed from the woman would crush the serpent head, to the time of David, a thousand years before Jesus was born. God reminds God's people and reminds David that his son would suffer and die, rise again, and rule forever. This is a God who keeps his promises. And if he keeps his promises so meticulously in the past, he will continue to keep his promises today. Your relationship with, with God is built not on your obedience to him, but on, on his promises to you, and it is built on Christ, who suffered and died and rose again for you. So every time we hear about Jesus as the son of David, who was born in the town of David, to descendants of the house and line of David. Every time you hear those things, you are hearing God saying, fear not. Just remember how much time, thought, care, and expense went into my plans for you. And when you hear those words, son of David, born in the town of David, to the house and line of David, let us also echo and say, yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you for reminding us that you are faithful to your loving promises, always and forever. For this is how you build your house. You build your house on your promises. You build your house on David's greatest son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us today here on Emmanuel Cares, the podcast. We encourage you to find out more about us on our webpage at emmanuelshirley.com. There's Bible connections. There's a podcast called Casting Nets. There's opportunities for you to get involved to help us to be a country church that cares. Emmanuel means God with us. When you leave today knowing that your God is with you because he cares for you.